We're talking about cell structure and today's notes are about the introduction to cells and microscopy using, using my, microscopes. So cells as we know it were unknown before the 17th century because before that time there were no microscopes and therefore um, no one had seen anything smaller than, than they could see with their unaided eye. Some of the earliest scientists to discover things about cells were Robert Hooke and Antony Van Leeuwenhoek. Uh, Robert Hooke was one of the first that was the first one that we credit with the name cell because when he looked at a picture of cork when he looked at cork cells under his microscope a thin slice of cork he saw what he looked what he thought looked like lots of tiny little rooms or cells like uh, monks use in a, a monastery um, on the left there's a picture that Hooke drew when he looked through the microscope you can see the patterns that he sees there he shows there these are empty cells just, just the cell walls are left with them with the cork and on the right there's an actual micrograph a modern micrograph of cork cells so you can see that what he drew there on the left is very similar to what you can currently see under the microscope uh, the other person that we credit with some in, uh, discoveries about cells was Anthony van Leeuwenhoek or Anton van Leeuwenhoek from from the Netherlands he was the first person that we credit with being able to see live cells under the microscope. He actually invented his own microscope. It was a very different looking microscope. It looks kind of like this. You can see that there are two plates that are riveted together up here. There's a little hole right here. There's a lens in between here. And he would put a drop of water on this little nail here and then use these screws here and here to move the drop closer to or farther away up down. Um, in and out to focus it and he would hold it up in front of his eye to look through uh, through the hole to see things and it's amazing how much he really could see with this little tiny microscope uh, but he was the first person to see actual living cells he looked at pond water he looked at teeth scrapings and various other kinds of materials and saw actual live cells moving around in the water and he, he called them animalcules because they were tiny little things that looked like tiny little animals these discoveries and others led to the development of the cell theory in the 19th century. It took about 200 years and lots of observations for a scientist to come up with what we now call the cell theory. Um, light microscopes, as we say, were first developed in the 17th century, and there have been improvements in the structure and the optics, uh, the quality of the lenses up until the mid 20th century. Useful magnification for most light microscopes is up to about 1,000 times. There are some that can magnify a little bit more, maybe up to 1,500 times under special conditions in special laboratories. But most uh, microscopes that you can use nowadays, especially in school microscopes, uh, the useful magnification is up to about 10,000 times. One thing that is a limit to the magnification of microscopes is the limit on resolution, which is the ability to show two nearby objects as separate objects. In the case of light microscopes, the limit on a resolution is about two tenths of a micrometer. A micrometer is one thousandth of a millimeter or one millionth of a meter, very, very tiny. But uh, objects that are smaller than that or objects that are closer than that can't be uh, determined as being separate objects because of the size of the uh, wavelength of light that is necessary for the, um, for the um, elimination of the object. There are staining techniques that can be used with, with specimens and slides that increase contrast and highlight various cell parts. And so there, there are lots of details that you can see and lots of special um, microscopic techniques that have been developed in the latter half of the 20th century. But the limit to what you can see is, is, uh, is about 1,000 to 1,500 times magnification. This is what a general light microscope looks like nowadays. Um, very, very similar to the ones that we have in lab. Ours are a little bit different, but not too much. There's an eyepiece up here, a body tube, uh, various objectives with different magnification lenses in there, stage clips to hold your slide in place, a stage, of course, the diaphragm, which, um, which can vary the amount of light that shows through the specimen. There's uh, a knobs for adjustments, for uh, focusing, and of course the light source that's necessary there for you to see anything with a light microscope. In the mid uh, 20th century, electron microscopes were invented and these allow us to see things even smaller than light microscopes because rather than a beam of light to eliminate the object, 
they use, it uses a beam of electrons. The wavelength of the electron beam is a lot smaller than the wavelength of light, and this allows increased magnification and resolution. Uh, as fine as two nanometers, a nanometer is one thousandth of a micrometer, so these are a hundred to thousand times smaller than light microscopes can see. There are two main types of electron microscopes. There's a scanning electron microscope that shows surfaces in great detail because it scans the surfaces with a beam of electrons, and there's a transmission electron microscope that shows internal structures and operates more or less the same way that a light microscope works. <clears throat> Here's what electron microscopes look like. They're fairly large. The, the desk portion is actually about the size of a teacher's desk, but they have machinery inside that um, creates a vacuum or pumps all the air out of the column where the specimen is placed. The, column is, the specimen is placed in, to a, in a little tube right here, and this whole column is evacuated from, of air with a, with a vacuum pump so that the electron beam is not scattered by any stray molecules that might possibly be in there. The electron beam is so narrow, so fine, that even random molecules of oxygen or nitrogen could scatter the beam like someone standing in front of or passing in front of your flashlight beam. And so it's important to make sure that you evacuate all the air. For this reason, and, for the, and, and because of the, of the processing uh, requirements of, producing, of processing the specimen to be viewed, you can't look at live specimens in the electron microscope. All specimens viewed in the electron microscope will be dead because of the processing and the evacuation of air through the vacuum tube. This is a transmission electron microscope that shows image something like this. The, the uh, electrons pass through the specimen through a thin section of the specimen. You can see lots of detail. Here are some mitochondria, a food vacuole, the nucleus of the cell, and various other organelles that you can see in great deal detail, much more than you can see with a light microscope. <clears throat> the scanning electron microscope scans the surface of the, of the specimen with a beam of electrons, and when you view that on a video monitor, both of these microscopes are set up with camera setups to take pictures, and a lot of your analysis of your specimen is done by viewing the, um, the photographs. Uh, here is a scanning electron microscope of a paramecium showing the many fine little hair-like structures called cilia that allow these creatures that live in pond water to move very quickly um, around uh, as they feed and move around uh, their habitat. Now cells are very small <clears throat> and they need to remain small because that allows them to more efficiently move nutrients in and wastes out of the cell. That the cell's ability to take care of itself in this way is related to the surface area to volume ratio. And if you, uh, the, the bigger the surface area compared to the volume, the more efficiently the cells can work. We'll talk more about this when it's time to talk about cell division because it's a very important concept um, in determining why and when cells need to divide. But it's important for you to understand that cells need to remain small because they work more efficiently that way. Now, the plasma membrane or cell membrane forms a boundary between cells and their surroundings. This is made of a phospholipid bilayer with proteins embedded in it. The hydrophilic heads of the, of the uh, phospholipids face outward that are exposed to the aqueous solution that the cell is in and the cell contents themselves. And the hydrophobic tails face inwards. Uh, and they help regulate the flow of materials into and out of the cell. Basically, very small molecules like oxygen can diffuse across the mem membrane pretty easily, but larger molecules have difficulty. Charged molecules can't pass across unless they pass through special tubes and channels. This is the diagram showing you the general structure of the cell membrane, showing the hydrophilic heads facing outward, the hydrophobic tails in the middle, and then the different proteins that are embedded in the surface. Some of them are channels, are tubes that allow things to pass through, and others are recognition proteins. We'll talk a little bit more about cell membranes in another week or so. Um, some cells have all the same, I mean, some, uh, all cells have some of the same content. The cytoplasm is in present in all cells. This is a jelly-like fluid that has the cell contents floating in it. The chromosomes, all cells have DNA, and those are in the form of chromosomes. Uh, which don't really look most of the time like you're accustomed to seeing them, uh, but, they're, but it's present there and has all the controls necessary for the cell. 
And then all cells also have ribosomes, which are where proteins are put together. We're going to talk about each one of these organelles in turn and how they work. Um, prokaryotic cells um, are one of the two main kinds of cells. They're prokaryotic and eukaryotic cells. The prokaryotes, <clears throat> pro meaning before, and the karyo part referring to the nucleus, do not have a true nucleus or any other membrane-bound organelles. This is mostly bacteria and a few other organisms similar to that. Their DNA, rather than being enclosed in a nuclear membrane like a, like a eukaryote cell is, um, is in a, a region of the cell called the nucleoid region. It's not really a nucleus. It's just the center part where the, where the DNA resides. The ribosomes of prokaryotes are smaller than those of eukaryotes. All prokaryotes have a cell wall that's outside the cell membrane. There are other eukaryote cells that have cell walls also, but all prokaryotes definitely have a cell wall. Some of them have short projections called pili for attachment to surfaces, kind of like Velcro. And some also have large, longer projections called flagella that allow them to move around. The, in general, the prokaryotes are much smaller than eukaryotic cells, uh, no more than about a tenth the size. Some are much smaller than that compared to eukaryotic cells. This diagram shows you a picture of the prokaryotic cells. Uh, this picture is in your book in chapter four. And you can use this to help you label the diagram of the prokaryote cell in your uh, cell portfolio. Eukaryotic cells have, have a membrane-bound nucleus and other organelles that do specialized jobs inside the cell. These are divided into four main groups. The um, organelles that are involved in genetic control, which includes the nucleus and ribosomes. The endomembrane system, which is involved in the manufacture, distribution, and breakdown of molecules inside the cell. The energy processing organelles, including the mitochondria and the chloroplast. And the structural support structures, the cytoskeleton, the membrane, the cell walls, that are involved in the support of the cell. Here's an animal cell diagram. Again, this is the one from your book. You can use this to help you label the diagram uh, that you received in class showing a number of different organelles that are present in most, in most animal cells. Notice that there are some things that are not present in plant cells that are only present in animal cells. The centrioles and the lysosomes are present in animal cells, not in plants. Here's a diagram of a plant cell showing the various organelles that you normally find in a plant cell. And again, there are several things that are found only in plant cells and not in animal cells. The central vacuole, very large storage area in the plant cells chloroplast where photosynthesis occurs, and of course the cell wall that's not present in animal cells, and then the plasma desma are just connections that occur between the plant cells. We'll talk more about those in another section of notes. That concludes the notes on the introduction to cells.